Hello and welcome to our lecture on diabetic ketoacidosis. We'll start off by talking about the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. Then we'll move on and cover the symptoms seen in this disease. And finally, we'll finish off by discussing the lab values and treatment in these type of patients. So let's get started. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a life-threatening medical emergency commonly seen in patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Often, diabetic ketoacidosis is the initial presentation. Patients come to the hospital presenting as diabetic ketoacidosis and then are diagnosed for having type 1 diabetes mellitus. And that's when they start taking their insulin dosage. This condition is worsened by stress or if a patient who already has type 1 diabetes mellitus fails to take his insulin dosage. Let's see what happens in diabetic ketoacidosis in the next slide. So as we mentioned in our discussion earlier on type 1 diabetes mellitus, type 1 diabetes patients cannot produce any insulin, so you get total insulin deficiency. This tips insulin to glucagon ratio and favors glucagon's function. Also at the time of stress, which could be due to trauma or infection, catecholamine's production is stimulated, which in turn upregulates glucagon production and exacerbates this pathway. Glucagon then goes on to act on the liver and increase gluconeogenesis, which means making more of glucose, increase glycogenolysis, which is breakdown of glycogen into glucose, and decrease glucose utilization. All of these effects aim to raise the total blood glucose levels. In the adipose tissue, glucagon functions to break down fat to free fatty acids. Free fatty acids are then transported to the liver where it's converted into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA then gets converted into acetoacetic acid, which then further gets metabolized into beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetone. These three are also known as ketone bodies and they're responsible for many of the symptoms seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. Presence of ketone bodies in the blood indicates ketonemia, and ketone bodies have the tendency to release protons, which can cause ketoacidosis. Let's look at how ketoacidosis can affect the patient. In the central nervous system, ketone bodies stimulate the emetic centers in the chemoreceptor trigger zone of medulla and cause nausea and vomiting. Additional effects of ketone bodies on CNS are altered mental status, where the patient cannot think properly, and cerebral edema can occur in severe cases. Now, since ketone bodies are producing a lot of protons, Extracellular fluid gets concentrated with protons, so there's a membrane channel present in many cells of the body called hydrogen potassium channel. What this channel does is it takes hydrogen ions which are present in higher quantities in the extracellular fluid and exchanges it with the potassium ions which are present inside the cells. This will increase potassium ions concentration outside in the extracellular fluid and cause hyperkalemia. There is another channel present on the membrane of cells that you should know is called sodium potassium channel. This channel is responsible for keeping potassium inside the cell rather than outside. So it brings potassium into the cell by moving sodium out of the cell. And guess what? This channel is stimulated by insulin. Now in this condition, since we don't have any insulin in our body, sodium-potassium channel is not going to work properly and will further promote hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia can in turn cause arrhythmia, as well as increased potassium levels get filtered by the kidneys which can in turn lower the total body potassium levels. So although you have hyperkalemia as a result of a lot of potassium going from intracellular fluid to extracellular fluid, at the end of the day, the total body potassium levels are still dropping as they're being constantly filtered out by the kidneys. Acetone, which is one of the ketone bodies we mentioned earlier, gets exhaled by the lungs and can be recognized as fruity smell in the breath of the patient. Since we've got metabolic acidosis, the lungs also begin respiring more frequently. The idea behind this is that when you increase respiration, you breathe out more carbon dioxide. This drops carbon dioxide levels and helps the body to eliminate some of the acid and brings the pH back up in the blood. In doing so, however, it creates a characteristic pattern of breathing called Kussmaul's respiration. Ketone bodies also get filtered by the kidneys and can be detected as ketonuria. The kidneys filter high glucose as well, causing glycosuria. Furthermore, water follows glucose on its way out into the urine since glucose is osmotically active. This increases loss of water and electrolytes like sodium, potassium, phosphate, and magnesium. As a result, patient gets dehydrated. Let's look at the lab values seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. Glucose levels will be high, usually above 250 mg per deciliter. pH will be low due to ketoacidosis. Urine and serum ketones will be present. So for anion gap, you basically measure it by calculating the difference between unmeasured anions and unmeasured cations. Since ketone bodies are unmeasured anions, so anion gap will be high, and this state is also referred to as high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Finally, serum osmolarity will be variable, 
Serum osmolarity has more significance when we'll discuss hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, which is a complication seen more commonly in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Treating diabetic ketoacidosis revolves primarily around administering insulin. Insulin returns high glucose levels back to normal. Insulin also shuts down any further production of ketone bodies, which helps with managing acidosis. In addition, remember this channel that we mentioned earlier called sodium potassium channel, which is present on the membrane of most cells of the body and responds positively to insulin. So if we were to administer insulin, we are going to stimulate this channel which will shift the potassium from extracellular fluid to intracellular fluid. This will return the potassium levels back to normal. Lastly, IV fluids are generally given to hydrate the patient as some fluid was lost by the kidneys due to the osmotic effect of glucose. Okay, so there are a few things to note when administering insulin. So when you administer insulin, it will first correct the hyperglycemia and then if we continue giving insulin, it will further progress to cause hypoglycemia which we don't want. So it's better to add glucose to IV fluids a few hours after we have started the insulin therapy, but continue giving insulin until acidosis resolves. In addition, insulin rapidly shifts all the potassium from extracellular compartment to intracellular compartment. And remember total body potassium levels are already low since potassium was constantly getting filtered by the kidneys in this condition. So after administering insulin, it is possible to develop hypokalemia. To prevent this, we also need to add potassium to IV fluids a few hours after we have started the therapy. So that's all for diabetic ketoacidosis. I really hope everything made sense. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and comment down in the comment section below. And please make sure to subscribe to our channel.